Now, although a lot of skills are pretty advanced by the end of our sensory motor and pre-operational thought stages, according to Piaget, there are some skills we still struggle with in those early preschool and early elementary ages. And one of the skills we continue to struggle with is the notion of egocentrism. And so egocentrism is the idea that we have a hard time taking the physical, visual, and psychological perspective of others. And so understanding that others don't always hear the same things you hear or they don't see the same things you see is really hard. We see this a lot in younger siblings who might be constantly poking and annoying their older sibling. When the older sibling says, stop, you're hurting me or stop, you're annoying me. The younger sibling might say, I'm not hurting you. You find this fun. And they're not saying that to be a psychopath. They're saying that because they genuinely, that's their perspective and they think other people have the same perspective. And so there's a couple classic examples we used to do to test this. One of them is the mountain task. So with the mountain task, we'd actually have a three dimensional uh, prop that we'd put on a table and it would have three mountains. And then the three mountains, there'd be different objects. There might be flags or animals or houses or trees. But for example, let's say at the end of one mountain, there is a horse. And on the side of another mountain, there is a rabbit. And the way that it's set up, when you see the horse, you can't see the rabbit because the mountain peaks, they're blocking your view. And when you see the rabbit, you can't see the horse. What we do is we have to make sure we do the validity checks for this experiment. We walk the child around, we make sure they understand where the horse is, they understand where the rabbit is, we check their memory and their attention, and we say, do you remember what was on this side? Do you remember what's on that side, even without looking? And as long as they can, then they've met the validity checks. Then we get them to stand on, let's say, the side of the horse, while the researcher stands on the side with the rabbit. And we say, what can you see right now? They'll say the horse, and they'll say, what can I see right now? And the child will say, you see the horse. The child sees the horse, you see the rabbit, but the child thinks you also see the horse. They don't understand that you see something different than them. This is something they can pass by around three and a half, four years of age, but during the time where they don't pass it, it is really fascinating. We also see this manifest in just other types of daily experiences, such as back when before we had video calling, when people often talked on a landline phone that didn't have any images, if you asked a young child a question, they would often nod their head or shake their head because they didn't understand that the person on the other end of the conversation couldn't see them. And so nodding. We might actually nod and say yes as adults, but young children would forget to say yes and they would just nod as a response. Now we tend to get over this area of egocentrism by the time we're five. However, egocentrism does stick around in adolescence. It just looks a little bit different. For instance, there's two phenomena we tend to find that occur in adolescence quite often. One of them is called the imaginary audience. Now this existed before social media. And so this is the idea that adolescents often believe that everybody is always paying attention to them and they will notice even the smallest detail about them. Something like a stain on the shirt or something caught in their tooth or a blemish on the skin. They assume that everyone around them will almost always notice. It's true that today in the advent of social media, if you're posting a lot online, maybe people are paying attention to what you're posting, but it often is still overinflated and we tend to assume people are paying much closer attention to us than what they actually are. Another phenomenon that also happens in adolescence is the phenomenon of personal fable. And this is the idea that we often tell ourselves these stories that make us seem unique. And so it's the idea that we believe we're going to be rich and famous someday. We believe we're going to win the lottery or we're going to go and get the most advanced degree and become a world famous astronaut. Or we believe we can't get sick or we believe we're not going to get in a car crash. We have these personal fables that make us believe that we're going to be the lucky ones, that nothing bad is going to happen and that risky behavior is not going to have consequences for us. This is something that we start to adjust as we move into immersion adulthood and beyond but in adolescence, it is very salient. Now, egocentrism is tied really neatly to the next cognitive skill, which is called theory of mind. In fact, you could consider egocentrism as almost a subcomponent, but we'll separate them out for this course. So theory of mind is the idea that you can think about what other people are thinking. And so this is a little bit more advanced than egocentrism for our definition. It's the idea that you understand if somebody's reaching for an object, you understand they want that object. 
And we can see this in young infants. If we have a researcher who pretends to drop something in a controlled experiment and they're reaching for it but can't reach it, infants will often pick it up and hand it to the researcher so they understand. If there's two objects there and the researcher's reaching for one, the infants can differentiate and understand which object they want and they'll pass it to them. So they understand your intention. We also see this very early on through pointing behavior. If you point across this room, if you point across the room and say, hey, look, most infants and toddlers can follow your gaze and have that shared gaze and joint attention. And so this is the idea that they understand what is in your mind, they understand what you're looking at. We know lots of animals can do this too, dogs in particular are really good at joint attention. This also becomes very important as we get older and we start to think about what other people are thinking. We start to think about what they know and what they don't know. And so very early on, we start to test things like, can you, do you know that the other person is thinking about pie? Or do you know that the other person knows there is no pie or there is pie? And this becomes quite mastered by the time we become in middle school. By middle school, we can do a couple different layers of this theory of mind. We can say, does Jillian know that Jake knows, that Sandra knows, that Bobby knows that Jillian went here? And you could do all these different layers of it. And middle school kids are really good at this. This is how gossip persists. And they could do really advanced theory of mind. That being said, some individuals do struggle with theory of mind. In particular, we know individuals on the autism spectrum tend to struggle. We can see this in infancy where the joint attention and the pointing, they tend to respond to very differently and they have a hard time understanding what another person is pointing at or what another person is referencing. And then when we get to things like what we call a false belief task, it becomes much more difficult. So what is a false belief task? Well, one example is the Sally and Ann task, or sometimes called the Sally Ann task. And so this is usually played out with two dolls or two puppets, and one's usually a blonde and one's usually a brunette. Sally's almost always the blonde, Ann's usually the brunette. And it's a location-based false belief task. So there's lots of different variations, but for this, imagine we're using a cupboard versus a basket. How this tends to play out is Sally has a chocolate, and Sally is alone. Anne's not there, just Sally's there. And Sally places her chocolate into a basket. And then Sally leaves. When Sally's gone, Anne arrives. And Anne discovers the chocolate in the basket. She moves the chocolate from the basket to the cupboard. And Anne places the chocolate in the cupboard. And then Anne leaves. Anne is now gone and Sally returns. And we have to do a lot of validity checks with kids for this one. We ask them, where did Sally originally put the chocolate? And they have to say in the basket. Where did Anne move the chocolate? Into the cupboard. Where is the chocolate now? In the cupboard. And we'll ask them, where will Sally look for the chocolate? Now this is a false belief task because what's happening here is the child knows where the chocolate actually is. They know the chocolate is in the cupboard. But does Sally know that? If a child has theory of mind, they will be able to take Sally's perspective and not their own. And they'll be able to say, Sally will look for the chocolate where she last left it. She didn't know Anne moved it. And she will look for the chocolate in the basket. And so that is showing that you understand Sally's perspective. However, children that are three or four years of age will often say that Sally will look in the cupboard, that Sally will look in the second location rather than the first location. This is something we see individuals on the autism spectrum struggle with right through adolescence into young adulthood in many cases. But for typically developing kids, we can see this mastered and we can see the Sally Ann task passed by the time they're four and a half or five years of age. Now, of course, we can see how these cognitive skills are starting to stack. In order to really test this theory of mind, we have to make sure there's attention. We have to make sure there's object permanence. We have to make sure that they can move beyond egocentrism. So we start to really stack these cognitive skills to get to these more advanced ones. And another type of skill that really starts to get mastered around ages four and a half, five years of age is the skill of reversibility. And so reversibility is the idea that not just taking someone else's perspective, but taking your perspective from a previous time, even just a couple minutes before. This is something that really young kids struggle with. So it's the idea they can recall and rewind and say, oh, what did I think before you just told me that? Was I fooled or was I not? And we see this with two additional false belief tasks. One of them is called the Smarties task. And we're talking about Smarties as they exist in Canada. They're the, co the, the color-coded chocolate candies. 
And so what often happens here is you have a box of Smarties and you shake the box of Smarties and you ask the child, what is this? And they say, oh, it's, it's candy, it's chocolate, it's Smarties. And you shake it and you say, what's inside this box? And a validity check is they'll say, oh, there's candy in that box. Then you open the box of Smarties and sadly, it's not candy in the box, it's golf pencils or it's paper clips. And you show the child, you say, oh, what's actually in this box? And they say, oh, it's pencils, oh, it's paper clips. That's interesting. And then you ask them, this is how we measure the reversibility. We say, before I open this box, what did you think was in it? And, and then you close the box back up and say, what did you think was in it? And they'll say, oh, I knew there was pencils in the box. Oh, I knew there was paper clip in the box. Even though you might even have it on video that they didn't, you could replay the video and show them they thought it was Smarties. But they'll say, no, no, I knew it was pencils all along. So they're lacking that reversibility. We can also use this as a theory mind false belief task because then you can say if we have this puppet here and we close the box what will the puppet think is in the box and the child will say oh the puppet will know there's pencils or if we say your mom's waiting outside in the hallway of the research lab what will she think is in the box they'll say mom will know there's pencils in the box so they're not they're not understanding that they might know something and somebody else doesn't know they have a hard time understanding somebody else might have a false belief about something that they have a truthful belief about. And the last one, one of my favorite ones, but really hard to do with online learning is the rock task. So what happens here is we bring in a visual aid that looks like a rock and it looks like a big heavy rock and we put it down in front of the child and we say, what is this? And it looks like a rock. So the child will say it's a rock. And then we pass it to the child and it turns out it's a squishy sponge that's painted to look like a rock. And we say, what is it? And they say, oh, I, it's a sponge or it's soft or it's a toy. And they'll be like, it's not a rock. And we take the rock back and we say, before you squished, before you got to hold it, what did you think it was? And again, if they lack reversibility, they'll say, I knew it was a sponge. If they have reversibility, they'll say they knew it was a rock. And then we say, you know, your dad's waiting outside in the hallway. If we show this to your dad, what will he think it is? And if they don't have theory of mind, they'll say, oh, my dad will think it's a sponge. When realistically, if they have theory of mind, they should know that if it's painted well enough, their parent will think it's a rock. And so this is how theory of mind and reversibility also start to stack together in these false belief tasks.